The voiceover is being provided by myself, Ian Sen, a second year emergency medicine resident at the Henry Ford Hospital uh, Department of Emergency Medicine. Upon completion of this presentation, the participant will be able to define cardiogenic shock and its causes, outline the initial approach and management of cardiogenic shock, discuss the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines for early mechanical revascularization of acute myocardial infarction patients in cardiogenic shock, relate the definitions and pathogenesis of acute coronary syndrome, outline treatment protocols for acute coronary syndromes, describe the TIMI risk factors, outline the American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association guidelines for the management of patients with unstable angina and non-ST segment elevation MI, identify the management and treatment of congestive heart failure patients. Cardiogenic shock is defined as persistent hypotension and tissue hypoperfusion due to cardiac dysfunction in the presence of adequate intravascular volume. Clinical signs of cardiogenic shock include sustained systolic blood pressure less than 90 millimeters of mercury, tachycardia, oliguria, cool extremities, and altered mental status. Hemodynamic findings include cardiac index less than 2.2 liters per minute and pulmonary artery occlusion pressure over 15 millimeters of mercury. The most common causes of cardiogenic shock are left ventricular failure due to massive myocardial infarction, mechanical complications of acute myocardial infarction that lead to cardiogenic shock include acute severe mitral regurgitation due to papillary muscle rupture, ventricular septal rupture, and cardiac free wall rupture. Right ventricular infarction complicating acute inferior wall infarction often leads to cardiogenic shock. Causes other than acute MI include end-stage cardiomyopathy, fulminant myocarditis, and transient apical ballooning syndrome or stress cardiomyopathy. In patients with acute myocardial infarction who develop shock, only 25% will present in shock at hospital admission. Shock often develops during the first day of hospitalization. In the shock trial registry, the mean time from onset of myocardial infarction to shock was seven hours. While in the GUSTO trial of 1995, 11% were in shock at presentation and 89% developed or were diagnosed to have shock after admission. The pathophysiology of cardiogenic shock due to left ventricular failure from acute myocardial infarction includes irreversible left ventricular dysfunction due to myocardial necrosis. Potentially reversible left ventricular dysfunction may also be present due to processes termed myocardial stunning and hibernation. Stun myocardium demonstrates persistent dysfunction after ischemia has been relieved, for example, with thrombolysis or angioplasty. Function will return in hours to days. Hibernation refers to dysfunctional myocardium due to chronic ischemia. Ventricular wall motion abnormalities due to hibernation is potentially reversible with restoration of normal blood flow. Necrosis, stunning, and hibernation may all be present to varying degrees in patients with cardiogenic shock. The schematic summarizes the pathophysiology of left ventricular dysfunction seen in cardiogenic shock due to acute myocardial infarction. No return of function is anticipated in areas of myocardium which become necrotic. Reperfusion therapy in acute myocardial infarction may result in stunned myocardium and function of these areas will return after a period of supportive therapy. Areas of myocardium supplied by stenotic coronary arteries may be dysfunctional as a result of chronic ischemia and function can recover with revascularization. Recognizing the presence of cardiogenic shock early in its course is of paramount importance. Patients should be assessed rapidly to diagnose the cause of cardiogenic shock, including evaluation of the electrocardiogram, and echocardiography. 
Patients are evaluated regarding the need for sedation, supplemental oxygen, intubation, and mechanical ventilation. Initial medical therapy includes fluid challenge for significant hypotension if there is no evidence of pulmonary edema. Dopamine or norepinephrine are used to maintain arterial pressure adequate for tissue perfusion. Intraaortic balloon counterpulsation is very useful to support patients with cardiogenic shock. Beneficial hemodynamic effects include improving cardiac output by decreasing afterload and improving coronary blood flow without increasing myocardial oxygen demand. Current ACC AHA guidelines list balloon counterpulsation as a class 1 recommendation for patients with cardiogenic shock not responding quickly to other measures. It may result in short-term functional improvement of the ischemic myocardium. It likely does not improve outcomes unless its use is combined with coronary revascularization. The landmark shock trial prospectively randomized 302 patients with cardiogenic shock due to acute myocardial infarction and left ventricular failure to either emergency early revascularization with PCI or bypass surgery versus initial medical stabilization with drug therapy and balloon counterpulsation. The 30-day survival was higher in the revascularization group, although this improvement did not reach statistical significance. Looking at the 30-day six-month and one-year mortality, the results were better when patients were tracked for a period of six months and a year where statistical significance was reached in the two groups, the ones with revascularization and the others who were treated with medical management. Therefore, emergency revascularization with either coronary angioplasty or coronary bypass surgery is a class one indication in current AHA ACC guidelines for the treatment of cardiogenic shock due to acute myocardial infarction in patients younger than the age of 75. If it can be performed within the 36 hour period of the onset of shock. Patients older than 75 had worse outcomes with emergency revascularization in the shock trial. But the number of patients in this age group was small. Careful patient selection for urgent revascularization is important in those older than 75. Rapid transfer of patients with cardiogenic shock from hospitals without revascularization capability to those with the above facilities should occur early in the course of illness. Unfortunately, invasive procedures are underused in patients with cardiogenic shock. Registry data indicate that in 2001, only 44% of patients with cardiogenic shock underwent emergency revascularization. Another database reported in 2004 that only 54.4% of patients with cardiogenic shock underwent emergency angioplasty. Therefore, it is necessary to improve systems of care for myocardial infarction patients in order to translate the benefits of early revascularization to wider implementation.